Welcome to GovCast. I am your host, Managing Editor Amy Kluber. Stacy Album, Director of the Center for IT at NIH, actually appeared last year in an episode of CyberCast to discuss the security efforts underway at the agency, including the broader initiative of Optimize NIH, part of Reimagine HHS and aimed at identifying how areas that can be enhanced and improved in a collaborative effort. We found Album and her work inspiring to elaborate further on GovCast, discussing her role in government, her aspirations as a working mom, and journey to the agency. She's a staunch proponent of increasing women involvement in STEM and IT at that. I found her story to be an inspiring case that others across the American workforce can draw from. Stacy, thanks so much for joining us on GovCast. Great to have you today. Thanks for having me, Amy. It's great to be here. How did you come into the IT field? I've always worked in the federal government. I've spent my entire career there, as you heard recently on the CyberCast. And I've always worked in technology organizations. And while I can't say that that was intentional, I'm certainly glad that I did because it's been an incredibly rewarding experience and provided me opportunities that I could have never imagined when I was first entering the workforce. And it really all started back when I was finishing up my Master's of Business Administration at West Virginia University. As I was nearing completing my degree, you know, many of my classmates were seeking employment at a variety of private sector entities and finance and sales and consulting. And while I certainly could have opted for a role like that, I have to be honest that I just couldn't really get that excited about it other than the idea of earning a paycheck. And so I actually reached out to my finance professor who I had really connected with and sought out his advice on what to do. And he referred me to this program at the Department of Energy called the Career Intern Program. And so as part of the department's workforce strategy and succession planning efforts, they had this program where they were seeking MBAs and MPAs that had recently graduated to come into the government and fill a number of analyst positions. I looked into it. I got on the Department of Energy's website and I started reading about it and I couldn't believe all the things that the Department of Energy covered and how important they were. And I just thought, I really want to be a part of that. This makes so much sense for me. So I applied. I was accepted. And before I knew it, I was working as a budget analyst in the office of the chief information officer. And so what's really interesting is I came in and I found myself working on our financial operating plan, you know, reviewing line by line expenditures to see if what we were actually doing was what we had planned and if there was any discrepancies analyzing that. Another thing that I worked on was our congressional justifications. So, you know, each year we have to prepare and analyze and advocate for our budget and justify that. And so this was all really interesting work to me, honestly. Some people may find it not as interesting and maybe a little boring. I loved it. You know, finance was really my strength. And a couple months into my program at the Department of Energy, I was offered the opportunity to go on detail to the Office of Management and Budget. So this was a two-year program where you come in as a career conditional employee. You start at a certain GS level, and there's ladders to it that you can work your way up to a higher GS level. The goal is at the end, you become a permanent federal employee. One of the requirements of the program was to do some kind of rotation, either within your office, within the department, or you could go to other agencies. And the other interns that were in the program, you know, they might be in OCIO and they did a three-month detail in, say, the Office of Procurement to learn a different skill set. And so this detail that I was offered at the Office of Management and Budget was really quite ambitious when I look back at it. But it was certainly an opportunity that I could not pass up. The person that I was working for at the time, she was the CIO at the Department of Energy. So two months after starting and following her as the leader of our organization, She was named the new administrator for electronic government and information technology at the executive office of the president, Office of Management and Budget. 
she reached out to me. She said, you know, I know you're really ambitious and interested in learning and wanting to make an impact. And you have a requirement as part of this program to do some type of rotation or detail assignment. And I really could use your help coming with me and setting up my new office in this role. And so many people around me said, are you really sure you, you want to do that? You know, it's going to be a lot of work. It's going to be really demanding. And the days are going to be long and hard. And I was like, absolutely. And so I jumped at it. I didn't even really know quite what I was getting into, but I really admired her. I wanted to help. I wanted to make a difference. And so I followed her there and I ended up spending almost a year there in that role as her executive assistant. I just, I learned so much and met so many people. I mean, all the information, the requests, the people coming in and out of her office, it really gave me so much insight into the important work of government. And frankly, at that point, I found myself very invested in starting and continuing a career in the federal government after that experience. And, you know, I'll always have her to thank for that. When the detail was over, I did go back to the Department of Energy. And what was great about that is I wasn't just a budget analyst anymore, but I had this wealth of knowledge and insight and experience that I could now bring back and apply at the office of the CIO at the Department of Energy. So I started working closely with the new CIO, the one that had replaced the former one, and on a number of special projects in addition to doing my work as a budget analyst. So you mentioned the benefit of doing these kind of rotational programs or internship programs for government. Is there a benefit for IT to do more of that? Yes, absolutely. And I would say not just IT, but anyone in their career. I mean, you should always take advantage of whatever opportunities might be at your disposal. So in this example that uh, I just talked about, I think one of the main reasons I was afforded the opportunity was not because I was in a program with a requirement to do that, but because I had connected with this leader, I had repeatedly expressed interest in learning more, doing more, making an impact. And so when the opportunity came up, it was obvious to look to see if I was interested in it. And so I think a lot of what happens in our careers is really about the opportunities that we create for ourselves, not what others around us are doing through different programs. Those are really just there to take advantage of when we're ready to take advantage of them. And if you look at my kind of history of my federal career to date, I've taken on progressive roles every couple years. You know, even if I stayed at the same agency, I moved into a bigger or a different role after I was there for a couple years. And one of the things that was crucial to being able to progressively move up and take on larger and different roles was to do more in the role that I was in at the time than was required. So, for example, you know, I've been a budget analyst, I've been a program analyst, I've been a policy analyst, I've been a portfolio manager, I've been a program manager. And I remember when I was a program analyst, when I first joined the National Science Foundation, you know, my responsibility was to come in and to help with the IT management functions at the National Science Foundation. And of course I did that, and I, I think I did it pretty well. And then we were getting ready to let a new contract, and someone said, oh, you know, we need a contracting officer's representative. And it was like, nobody put their hand up. People are like looking at the floor when it's like, who's gonna be the core? And I thought, I'll do it. I'll go to training. I'll take on the responsibility. And people said, really? And I said, absolutely. And I did that, and I ended up being a core for five years. And having that experience with administering contracts has given me subject matter expertise that has served me well throughout the rest of my career. You know, there were other times when then I moved up into more of a program manager type role, and I had a series of functions that I was responsible for leading. And then we had a new congressional requirement come out where we had to 
make changes to our grants management systems to increase access to the results of federally funded research, in this case, funded by the National Science Foundation. And it was a very important requirement. We had a very short time to meet it. And the way we had to go about doing it was going to be a bit challenging, given the way our systems were currently configured. I didn't have a background in software development, But I said, I think that I could take the lead on this and I could make it happen. And again, people kind of looked at me like, really? I said, sure. And I'll keep doing my other work. And so I said, because a lot of this is really just about forming a team and leading and motivating that team with all the right people and skills and expertise of what it's going to take to make this happen. Partnering with the business side, with the, the grants policy office reading the legislation, talking to legislative affairs, understanding what is this requirement really getting at and how can we meet the spirit and intent of it in a phased incremental approach possibly. And so we did that. And then within less than a year, you know, I led a team of developers and architects and business analysts and testers and also worked with the infrastructure side to set up environments and do everything they needed to do with the databases. And we had the public site up and running and met the requirement. And so one thing I did learn through that experience was that I didn't want to spend my career doing software development and maintenance, but it was a very important experience to have and knowledge to gain that, again, served me well as I moved into the role of being responsible for the entire IT investment portfolio at that agency. Because now I had a better understanding of our infrastructure. We were predominantly, you know, we were a grants making agency. So we were a, had a predominantly software development and maintenance in our portfolio and what that really entailed. And so I guess my point is that it's really important to if you want to grow and learn and make an impact and do that in a progressive fashion, it's really important not to just fulfill, you know, the core duties of what your role entails at that point in time, but where you see opportunities that you can grow and learn and take on more and make an even bigger impact, you should do so for the benefit of that experience. And then that will prepare you for the next phase of your career. Now, taking a look at into your current role at the NIH, what were some of the lessons learned from your previous roles that you now feel like contributed to a large portion of what you're doing now at the NIH? Well, one thing I would say is that I've always had the benefit of having really strong role models. And so, for example, you know, I started at the Department of Energy and moved over to the Office of Management and Budget. And the person that I was working for at that time was Karen Evans. And I learned so much just by by watching her. And I was very invested in her agenda and supporting it. And when I left OMB and went to the National Science Foundation, I was able to reflect on kind of like the strategy and the techniques and the tactics that she took at the government-wide level to make an enterprise-wide impact at the National Science Foundation. While I was at the National Science Foundation, you know, at that time, when I first arrived there, I was working for Andrea Norris, who's now the, the director of CIT and the CIO at NIH. And I learned a lot from her, along with two other women that followed in her footsteps as CIO of National Science Foundation, which was Amy Northcutt, and then uh, now Dorothy Arnson. And so I've had the benefit of working for and with these four women. And really, it's been more about watching them and working with them and learning from them, which have all been very different. You know, their backgrounds are different. Their styles are different. What they focus on is different. And then as I grow and move on, to a different role or to a different agency, I feel like what I learned working underneath them, I've taken with me, even if they're still back at the other agency or somewhere else. And at the time, you know, a lot of times when I'm working for them, 
I don't completely understand why they're doing what they're doing. I just know that they've got a broad perspective. They have a lot of responsibility and a lot of expertise and experience. So, for example, when I came to NIH, which was a very, you know, CIT is a very large, complex operation. You know, when I was at National Science Foundation, it was smaller, more centralized. You know, working at OMB was really more about government-wide policy. And so it was a little bit different in the sense that it was larger, more complex than what I'd previously done. I found myself asking myself things like, what would Dorothy do? Or what would Amy do? Or what would Karen do in these situations? And I would think back of experiences where I was in a similar situation working underneath them as I am now in my role and really reflecting on and drawing on those experiences and then using that to inform kind of my approach and tactics for tackling similar challenges. And I found it to be incredibly effective. So to me, it's more about those role models and relationships and the those working dynamics and those tactics and techniques and strategies than kind of the actual functions or subject matter at hand. So all those role models are women. Yes. Do you think that adds another element to being a role model? Absolutely. I mean, it's certainly for me. I personally believe that at times it can be really hard to be a woman working in a male-dominated workforce. And I certainly don't ever want to think of myself as any kind of like victim or anything like that. But I think it's really important to be cognizant of the environment that you're operating in. So, I mean, you've really picked up on it. A lot of what I've learned from them is how to be that strong female leader in these kind of environments. And so when I was finishing up my time at the National Science Foundation and then now in my role at NIH, there was a point, I don't know quite when it happened, when I became not the one just learning from and following these other women, but setting the example myself for other women. And it really hit home with me in particular when I had my youngest child a couple years ago. I was starting at NIH and as a new executive, and I was expecting as well. Uh, My son's now a little over two years old. And I remember thinking at the time and talking to some of my close friends, this kind of circle and network of people who believe in you about how am I going to do this? I'm going to a new agency, a new environment. I'm a new executive and a new mother again. And they said, well, you're just going to do it and you're going to be great. And there's going to be a lot of people watching you. And other women are going to be watching you and thinking, well, she can do it. I can do it, too. And so I really kind of took that to heart and kept that spirit in mind as I went to work every day. And I think it's important to not only have those kind of present role models and relationships, but also to really look back on the pioneering and trailblazing women that even made it possible for someone like myself to be doing what I'm doing today. So I started at NIH in 2017, and that's a bit of a special year because it also marks the anniversary of 100 years of women in Congress. So in 1917, Jeanette Rankin of Montana became the first woman to serve in Congress. What was really remarkable to me about that is that it was Montana, of all states, that elected the first woman into Congress. What many people don't know about me is that my family is from Montana. It all comes full (laughs) circle. (laughs) Yes. I was born in Minot, North Dakota. Wow. And my grandfather was a wheat farmer up in northeast Montana, very rural country. So as part of this celebration of 100 years of women in Congress, a group of us went and did this visit to Capitol Hill and had a a lovely discussion with the historian there for the House of Representatives. And he told the story of Jeanette Rankin, who was the daughter of a rancher 
and a, a huge advocate for women's right and the whole suffrage movement back then, a real pioneer in women's rights. And I was dying to ask the question of why Montana? Because, you know, that really rang home with me. And so fortunately, somebody else asked the question. And he said, well, when you think about it, back in the pioneer days, women played a very important role. Farming is a very difficult thing to do. If you know anything about farming, it's not easy. And it takes the entire family to survive, including the women. And so that made so much sense to me. And it made me think about my grandmother and my great-grandmother. I mean, my great-grandmother single-handedly ran a boarding house while raising all of her children. My grandmother helped run the farm along with my grandfather, my father, and his four brothers. And my grandfather also worked for the Department of Agriculture at the time for the local county office as a grain inspector. So unbeknownst to me, originally, I actually have a history of federal government in my family that I didn't even quite realize because I always thought of my grandfather as just a wheat farmer. (laughs) And so where this does really come full circle is that this idea of a woman working hard for herself to make a life for herself and her family and to really make a broader impact is in my blood. And, And people often describe me as tough, you know, people who work with me say, well, Stacey has really high standards, but also fair and also someone who really has a lot of care and compassion for people. And I think a lot of that dates back certainly to that history, starting with, you know, my great grandmother and grandmother and the Jeanette Rankins of the world leading all the way up to today of these women that I've been describing that I've learned so much from and have made a huge impact in my life. Taking a look at the, I guess, state of the workforce recruiting and government, what role do you think government has in upping some of those numbers in women in STEM and and government overall? I think a really important role. I think we need strategic efforts. You know, certainly NIH has, has an incredible number of activities underway to promote women in science. So you need strategic efforts like that. I think that just recruiting and retaining top talent in the federal government is a very important challenge overall. When someone asks, you know, why work for the federal government? I would say if you're looking for interesting, exciting, rewarding, challenging work, look no further than the federal government. The possibilities are really endless. I certainly feel like that's been the case in my career. And I'm not sure that the federal government always has that kind of image and appeal to people looking to enter the workforce or change careers. There are so many different missions you can support. There are so many different disciplines. And then even more so in the case of women in STEM fields. And so, again, I think it's just really important. I think the more that people can see and hear and feel what opportunities exist. And we need to do that through these kind of strategic efforts. But also just like on a day-to-day basis, like the stories that I've been describing. I don't think I would have been able to see what the possibilities were if I hadn't had these role models throughout my career to show me the way. So how do you think your path to government could inspire future recruits? Long term, if you really want to gain broad perspective and deep knowledge and make a huge impact, the best and fastest place to do that is in the federal government and to do work that you find rewarding on a daily basis. I know that you've had some of my colleagues on this show recently, Jeff Schilling from the National Cancer Institute and Alistair Thompson from the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. And they talked at length about the careers they kind of had before they were in the roles they're in today, especially Alistair, and contrasting it and how rewarding they found it given the things that they're doing at those research institutes. I think Jeff described it as 
this is the greatest show on earth. And I don't <laughs> think you could really sum it up better than that. So taking a look at some of your experiences in the research community mm -hmm. currently and then at NSF, of course, what importance does technology and more specifically IT play into the research community? Well, a huge role, and it's only increasing. One benefit I have had in my career is spending a lot of time interacting directly with the research community. So when I worked at the Office of Management and Budget, I was a portfolio manager for what they called a set of electronic government initiatives. And one of the sets of initiatives that was in my portfolio was electronic grants management. And that is a topic that is just near and dear to the hearts of the research community. You know, there's several populations, of course, out there that are applying for grants with the federal government. You have block grants. And then in the case of like NIH and NSF, you have research grants. So I spent a lot of time in that role going out and talking to different constituency groups about what was necessary. And at that time, the challenges they were having is that all these different agencies were developing systems to find and apply for grants with the federal government. And some were better than others. Some were still paper-based. But at the crux of it all is that researchers are doing really important work and they spend long hours on their research projects and their time is incredibly valuable. And the last thing they should have to deal with is to be burdened with administrative requirements by the federal government. And of course, there are reasons for certain information that we need to collect. But there's a way to do it where we're not overly burdening these researchers. And so honestly, that is a big part of what inspired me to move over to the National Science Foundation was that I really was drawn to the science and research mission into those communities. And so when I arrived at NSF, one of the roles I played was serving as the representative from the technology organization to the research community. So there we served about, I think it was like 2,500 plus institution and hundreds of thousands of research administrators and principal investigators all over the nation. And we would have these regional conferences where we would go and talk to them about our research agenda or science agenda and also what was happening with our systems. And so I got to hear firsthand from constituents about how our technology systems were serving them or not. That was really valuable because it wasn't just about technology then. I really understood why we were doing what we were doing in the IT organization. So now, you know, fast forward several years later, and it's not just about automating business processes, but technology is actually transforming and accelerating scientific discoveries in ways like never before. And data is at the center of all of it. And so at this point, you know, I talked a little bit before about how technology is just transforming what we're doing is our mission and at rates faster than ever, you know, whether that's through leveraging cloud environments to store and access and process data along with, you know, high performance computing capabilities or using things like artificial intelligence and, and deep learning to advance discoveries at a pace that was never possible before. So it's really interesting to see what the progression of and the role of technology has been throughout my career. And I'm not sure exactly where it's going to go from here, but I, I know it's just going to get bigger and better all the time. How is your office thinking about some of these maybe emerging technologies that are mm -hmm. coming. You mentioned automation and data being incredibly important in all of it. So how is your office approaching it or thinking about it? Well, when I arrived at NIH, we were in the midst of several IT modernization efforts. I talked about some of those before with modernizing our network, our high-performance computing capability, expanding that, having unified communications and collaboration capabilities for researchers to connect 
and share information globally with ease. And we've completed those for the most part. And it was important to take some time to pause and stabilize and look at maybe how we could optimize some of those investments. We made significant capital investments in those IT modernization activities, and we want to make sure that we can reap the benefit of them for many years to come. And given how mission critical they are, that operations management and business management of those services is, has been a real priority in the last year or so. So where does that leave us, though, is this is all very cyclical, and it's about time to start thinking about you know the next generation of technology services that we're going to provide. So we're certainly a 21st century organization, but now we're getting ready to initiate a set of strategic assessments that are going to look at things like our network architecture, data storage and computing needs, security architecture, and identity and access management capabilities. You know, how people can access and use information that they have a right to do so. And so we're just getting ready to initiate those. And really what that's intended to do is look at what should be our architecture and the state of those technology services, you know, for this 2020 era that we're now in? Thank you so much, Stacey. This was awesome. Uh, it was good to know more about your background and your path to government and hopefully that inspiring other people as well. This has been great. Thank you, Amy. GovCast is a production of Government CIO Media and Research. For more podcasts, head to governmentcio.com slash podcasts. If you liked what you hear, let us know by leaving us a review in iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. GovCast is produced by Amy Kluber. It is edited by Resonate Recordings. Theme music provided by Big Hoax. If you're interested in sponsoring a podcast, contact us at sponsor at governmentcio.com. <laughs>